All right. Let's get down to Genesis chapter 13. Okay, that should be fine. All right. Now remember, Lot and Abram, they left the land of Egypt, and that's where they seem to have gotten their wives. So Abram with the Egyptian handmaid Hagar that he later married, and Lot with his wife where he took to Sodom. But before he moved into Sodom, we're going to find out how this happened, what occurred, what the origins are, and everything. Let's look at Genesis chapter 13. And we'll look at verse 7. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. So basically there's a strife, there's a division, a disagreement or a fight between the people who took care of Abram's livestock and then the people who took care of Lot's livestock. Notice right here, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. So it's interesting, the Holy Spirit made sure to mention that the main story is about Abram and Lot fighting. But it's strange right here that Abram and Lot, while they were fighting, that the attention and the story should be on them. But the Bible says the Canaanite, the Perizzite, dwelled then in the land. Oh, why mention it now? in the middle of their fight, right? Why mention it right now in the middle of their fight when they could have discussed it or the Holy Spirit could have mentioned it many verses later or after the fight, right? So sometimes we're wondering why in the world would the Holy Spirit make mention of that unless it's important. So that's important to understand about biblical hermeneutics is that when the Holy Spirit makes mention of a certain wording, then the first thing to understand is it's important. It's there for a reason. It's not there randomly. That's a problem with a lot of Bible commentators and scholars is that they think that it's just random, that it's just happened to be there. But no, it's inserted for a reason. When you think that way, then you can find the deeper meaning. If you look at Genesis chapter 13 and verse 7, in the, the whole topic is about them fighting, but it just so happened that the Bible mentioned that lost, unbelieving people were right there in the middle of their fight. Now, take it this way. If I were to give a different example, you might better understand it. If I said that uh, Max and Robert Randall had a very ugly fight, I know that's impossible, okay? Robert would sooner fight with his wife than Max at all. That's so impossible. <laughs> but let's uh, take Max and Robert Randall as an example that they had a really big fight. And if it's a big fight, then you know it's a very ugly fight because they hardly fight at all. So then we're like, ooh, what's going on here? So then if the text reads, Robert and Max had a very ugly fight and the San Francisco, the people of San Francisco just happened to be there. Right, right. Then you can understand what's going on. What's going on is that it's a bad testimony. Yeah. When there are brethren fighting with each other and unbelievers just happen to be there, the text is, or the main point that's trying to drive home is that it's a bad testimony going on. Yeah. Now, if you read over here, Notice at verse 8, And Abram said unto Lot, so Abram's going to say something to Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee. So Abram is beseeching, he's pleading with Lot when he says, I pray thee, let there be what no strife, no division, no disunity between me and you, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen. For we be brethren. So between the people who take care of my livestock and the people who take care of your livestock, I don't want there to be division because we're all brethren. Right. Now notice right here when he's using that term, he's basically saying we're, in the, we're brethren. We're in the same team. Sometimes there are people who are not related to each other at all. Let's say that 
they're in a gang or they're in a team, they would usually say, if you're very close to the person, you're like my brother or you're my brother or we're a big family, right? right? In a Christian church, that's easier to say because we are spiritually brothers and sisters in Christ and literally brothers and sisters in Christ through a spiritual play. So when we say we be brethren, we're family, that's easier for us. But that's the idea is that we're, a, we're like a family together. We're in the same team at verse 8. So notice that there's a division, disunity in the same team, in this family. And then the Holy Spirit mentions that the Canaanite, the Parasite, the unbeliever, San Francisco, the people in Berkeley, just so happen to be there. Now that's a bad testimony. So sometimes, church, you have to ask yourself, when there's disunity, disagreement amongst us, remember this, people are watching us online. Remember this, people in this city know about us. They come across us. Your neighbors know you, especially if you're a family and there's division in the home. Oh, that'll get you under conviction, right? So they hear, they know, and it's a bad testimony. So what does the Bible say about that? We're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2. That's why it's very important that you have to be in unity together. You have to watch your testimony. You might say, why should I watch for my testimony? Because it just so happened that unbelievers, people who know you're a Christian, are watching you. Here's another thing. They are watching you even when you don't know they're watching you. Can I repeat that again? They are watching you even when you don't know they're watching you. When you keep that in mind, then you'd be more careful of your testimony. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. So that's what Lot and Abram were, right? They were strangers, pilgrims. They were not citizens of that land. They were wanderers, all right? They were nomads traveling. So this matches up with them. So we're likened to Abram and Lot. Abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. Why? Why should we avoid sin? Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. So notice right here, you have to watch your conversation, how your testimony is. If it's not honest in the eyes of the Gentiles, Remember this, they're speaking evil of you while you're living right, even when you're trying to maintain a good testimony. How much more will they speak evil of you or find evil with you when you have a bad testimony? That's why it's so important to watch it. Why? Because that way, uh, at the end, at the judgment, uh, they'll be without excuse. But they'll have their excuses when they say, well, so-and-so, I've seen too much division in the church, Lord. That's why I didn't become a Christian. How many of you heard that before? Oh, yeah. oh, I've seen a scandal in the church. That's why I can't come to uh, get saved or become a Christian. How many of you heard that before? I've seen family member fight with other family members, so that's the reason why I, I'm not going to get saved. How many of you heard that before? That's the reason why, church, it's so important to let uh, divisions die out. If there's something that you notice that I really harp on is make sure... There's no division. We're in the same team. Love each other unconditionally and then overlook imperfections. That's the reason why we get other churches and preachers, which is a good testimony, church, saying we're a unique church. Amen. Why do they say that? Despite of our age differences, nationality differences, personality differences, and even our personal differences, guess what? We just still try to love each other, overlook faults. So then that's the reason why you can enjoy a good fellowship or a good blowout and etc. Now look at Romans 12, Romans 12. I can't stress that strong enough. It's so important to have that because the, one of the number one problems in Bible believing churches that I've seen is strife. It's always division. It's always division, 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 division. We don't have to war against the world when we're at war with each other. <laughs> it's just uh, that messed up. Look at Romans chapter 12. And then we'll look at verse 9. 
Now notice what Paul says, let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good, be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Look at verse four, uh, Look at verse 16. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for a evil. Now notice that there's so much in this text. There's so much in this text about what? Unity? About preferring somebody else above you? Even if someone does you wrong, you do good to them? So that's the whole main idea. And it's interesting, the Apostle Paul writes amongst this, what? At the middle of verse 17. Providing things honest in the sight of all men. So Paul, when he's writing about loving each other and, you know, don't have differences or fights, in his mind, he's also thinking about our testimony, how it appears in the eyes of the lost world. That's why it's so important to make sure that the things you do is honest in people's sight. Right? Because they're all watching you and you got to honestly show it. What's your honest life, church? What is your honest life? I'll tell you what your honest life is. Personal. When it's personal and you're all alone and you think no one is watching you, right? That's personal. But let them see the true colors, the real you, the honest you. Let them see that. All right, let's turn to another pass. Let's go back to Genesis 13. Genesis chapter 13. We're going to look at Genesis 13. So it's important to understand that you have to have a good testimony. And the best way to have a good testimony is make sure that you get along with your family, with your spouse, all right? If you can overcome these differences with each other, then you should be able to apply the same thing in the church as well. If you're able to have enough patience with your child and with your spouse, you should be able to do that with your church member, all right, with your fellow brother or sister in Christ. And if you can't do that with the church member, I wonder how many differences you find with your spouse or with your family. And even more so when you're alone with God after that. Okay, something to think about. All right, let's look at Genesis chapter 13. Let's look at verse 9 and 10, 9 and 10. Now, this is an, probably the most important passage and the most important lesson from today's teaching I want you to pay attention to. The most interesting one will be a couple verses later, okay? But here's the most important lesson I want you to hear. Abram says, the last part of verse 8, we are brethren, Right? And remember, there's a strife and a division at verse 7 and 8. Verse 9, uh, verse 9, is not the whole land before thee? So Abram's pointing out to Lot, isn't the whole land before you? So what does he want to do? He wants to separate. Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. So Abram is telling Lot, I plead with you, I pray you, that you'll separate yourself from me. There's so much land out there, so take a different land, different spot. That way there's no division or strife between us. The middle of verse 9, if thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. So that's simple. Ab uh, Abram saying to Lot that if you go take the right hand, so if you go right where my hand is pointing toward, then I'll go left. You take the left hand, I'll go right. Now, remember, church, I hope that you're looking every single word in the Bible verse because the point of verse-by-verse -verse Bible study is so that you can understand every word you're reading in the Bible. Uh, people nowadays say the Bible is too hard to understand. Well, actually, it's not. If you take time to look at every word and then look it up and explain it to yourself like I'm doing, right? I'm doing that. It's, it might be boring or redundant, or you might go, I know, I know, I know. No, you don't know. So that's why it's important to look at the verse, every word, something does, uh, doesn't make sense to you. And then as I explain it, see if it matches up, and you'll go, oh, and then it'll click. And then what happens in, when you do your own personal Bible reading, it's much easier. And then the common sense just will come to you because you just don't have a common sense just yet. 
So that's why we have these classes. We have these classes so you can get a common sense gist. And then that way, when this is to help you, because when you go home, then you'll understand the Bible reading yourself. All right, I don't, I'm not the type of church that I just tell you something from a book and that's it. No, I don't do that. I want something where it benefits you because I care about you. You spent good money, good time, and, good, and a lot of driving to get over here. You might as well get your money's your time's worth. All right? So suck up everything that you have, all right? So in verse 9, we understand the explanation. If this is the explanation at verse 8 and 9, one of the most important basic doctrines is fellowship and separation. Now notice that there is a divide, a separation right here. And in this separation, it's important to understand that the Holy Ghost writes that both parties are not in the wrong here. There's not one party that's right, the other party that's wrong. It could be both parties are wrong. But the point is, is that the Holy Spirit doesn't say which party is more right, which party is more wrong. It just simply points out what? You're losing your testimony because there's disunity. Now, why would the Holy Spirit write that way? So the, the Holy Spirit's writing this way because of this. He wants to empathize with outsiders here. Now think about this. Let's say that there is a strife, uh, and there's always been strife in church history. For some of you who didn't know that. There's always been strife and divisions in church history, even the silliest things. George Mueller is a really holy man of God, prayer warrior, man full of faith, but he had a stupid, silly fight with Darby about close communion or open communion for the Lord's Supper, if I remember correctly. You'd be surprised. Uh, William Booth didn't get along with another preacher. I forgot who it was, but you'd be surprised. J. Frank Norris, the one who started the independent Baptist movement, so to speak, he had two to three splits. And these two guys became giants of the movements. They're John Rawlings and then Bouchant Vic. So you have to understand that it's always inevitable within uh, the right kind of church and good Christians that there's going to be a split, a separation. And then you might go, well, which one's right, which one's wrong? Oh, I'm going to lose my faith. No, that's, you don't have to lose your faith here because outside of the Christian world, you ever seen family fights before? And then you just don't get involved, right? Yeah, that's the point. It's called reality. Reality is don't shake your faith, don't think it's the end of the world and you get bitter and mad. That's very immature. Okay, because that happens in families, too. All right. If you can do that in the family, you can do that in the church. You can do that with the rest of the world. You have to understand that from an outside perspective, the Lord's not going to pick a side who's more right, who's more wrong. Now, sometimes that does happen in the uh, epistles, the writings of uh, Paul and John. He mentions about people who, tr who started church splits and then. The, uh, the preachers would be the ones that are right. The ones who split the church are wrong. Or the, one, or the pastors would be the ones that are wrong, bringing false prophecy, and the member would be right. But uh, sometimes the scripture does that. But you have to understand there are times also that it doesn't show which party is right and which party is wrong. Why doesn't the Lord do that? Wouldn't the Lord know who's more right, who's more wrong? Sure he would. But he doesn't mention it right here. Why is that? Because... A lot of times, the Lord, what He wants is that within the separation from one party with the next party, what He wants to do is that party himself or herself, that party is going to be held accountable to God, not the outsider. It's not your place to judge who's right and who's wrong, because what's the point of that anyway? You have to be more concerned about your own life. So God, he says, that's not the important point here. The important point is you yourself held accountable. So then this party has to be held accountable to God solo. So then who's right and who's wrong? Nobody knows except him and God, right. her and God. Right. That's the idea. You have to understand that. So then what does the outsider do in this point? So then this is the party right here. And then let's look at the outsider. 
from the outsider, which is in our case, this is Abram Lot. And then we'll look at uh, one more example later on. The outsider is, I don't know who's right and who's wrong. But it's simple. Just like these parties, they're, they're solo held accountable with God, you should too. Yeah. That's the right perspective that you should have. Not like picking sides and picking teams. One thing I learned all the time is within uh, disputes and divisions, one thing I've learned is, oh, don't pick a side. Don't pick a side unless the Holy Spirit makes it very clear and unless there's strong evidence. But do not pick a side. It's always ugly at the end. And then you just so happen to team up with somebody who was wrong about something that you didn't know until later and you regretted it. Right. Yes, I know what I'm talking about, okay? That's why I've learned hands off. Yeah. Right. That's why I've learned just shut the mouth. Yeah. Because why? I've been there and I made the mistakes. I know what I'm talking about. And I, I'm pretty much sure that nearly all of you know what I'm talking about. Okay? So that's why we can agree with this point here. It's very important that you yourself are the judge in your own matter. And then within that division, within that fight, what am I accountable for? Not those guys, all right? Let those guys be accountable to God. What I should be accountable for. Now, in this, once we understand that, what does the Lord do in this case from an outsider perspective? He doesn't show who's in the right and wrong. All the Lord points out was what's wrong. There was disunity, division. That's it. And it's a bad testimony. Why? Because God wants, basically, you've got to love one another. You've got to overcome it. But reality hits. Reality hits where there's going to be, have to be a separation. And there is disunity. That's reality. That's inevitable. No matter how much love you show, it's going to be inevitable. That's why Paul says in Romans 12, let love be without dissimulation. But he says, as much as be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Why? Because it's impossible to be loving, peaceful all the time. That's a, that reality is it's not going to happen. So then, when such a case happens... Who's right, who's wrong in the split? Nobody except them and God. From the outsider perspective, the Lord's going to say right here that basically it's not that who's more right or who's more wrong, but that's basically it's needed. It's needful. It's needful that there is a split. Now, I know that's hard to hear, but sometimes, no matter how much love you show or you put up with, Reality hits, we're all flesh, we all have differences, and it's going to be stressful for us to overcome. So then the Lord says it's just needful to split. Okay, here's a good example, okay? Uh, I mean, I love Pastor Andrew so much in the Lord, and I know he does uh, more to me than I do to him, all right? But think about it. Can you picture us both pastoring the same church together? Yeah, not enough room. You got it. You're hitting the main point here. It's inevitable his personality is different, my personality is different. And it's inevitable that there's not enough room either. Why? Because people are coming in. New situations will come out as well. New scenarios. And then, what's the best scenario? It's, the best scenario is that he'll probably be seven hours away from me and I'm seven hours away from him. And I guess I'm Lot because I chose Sodom in the plains of Jordan, you know, and he's probably at Bethel some, somewhere taking care of sheep. So that's the point right here. The point is, why is it needful? It's needful because there's not, there's not enough room for both of us. It's important to understand that. So then, when there's a split in life, you have to take it as a good thing, as the best of both parties. A lot of times we don't want to. The most ideal is to be in unity, right? But if we're going to be totally honest, we're very, very different as people. Right. Amen. We're very, very different as people, and it's impossible that uh, we're always going to grow. And that's what the Catholic Church emphasizes, right? Unity, unity. You Baptists are just such church splitters and mainstream uh, orthodoxy or the mainstream Christian churches. But that's why they fall into apostasy. See that? Yeah. See how you fall into apostasy 
is because there's no independent mindset here. There's no local independent mindset. And God gives different callings. Yeah. The problem with people is when we have our local independent mindset, we're so fleshly and we, we don't know how to manage and control it and balance it into unity. Let me tell you something. If you delve deeper and deeper into the doctrines of this book and you start teaching it, yeah. you will face something controversial yeah. with yeah. other Bible believers. Oh, yeah. I guarantee you. Yeah. I promise you. I promise you. You'll come across it with me one day too. I promise you. Yeah. That's true. But how do I maintain the unity is that, see, I, when I don't hesitate to go deep into the book, but I also at the same time, how can I say it in a way that unifies it? Yeah. How can I say it in a way that doesn't cause controversy? Yeah. So that's how I do it. But that's my unique personality. The reason why is I come from so many different diverse backgrounds. I go to liberal universities. I went to the South of all places. And what, what people would ex, uh, consider an extremely right-wing Christian school. And then I also grew up amongst different cultures. That's why, because that's what I am in my personality. And I went through a lot of pain to develop that. It wasn't easy. And because I'm young and fresh with that strength, that's why I can put up with all of that. And that's how I am what I am today. If you look at other Bible-believing preachers, they're not like that. All right? They don't have a life like mine. So you have to understand, that's why um, if they were to collide with each other in their ministries, it's split. So it's so important that, uh, in my case, it's because I went through all those different experiences. That's why I can learn to try to keep it in unity. But even no matter how much I keep it in unity, guess what? This might be shocking to some of you. There are some Bible-believing preachers that I support and that uh, I pray for and I want God to use mightily, but I stay separate from them. Didn't you know that? That's shocking to some of you, right? Why? Because there was something personal that happened before. It's always something personal. That's the thing with the parties of Lot and Abram's flocks. Something personal happened. All right? And it can be a good spiritual reason, too. We don't know what happened with every trivial detail of, you know, what one, uh, one person who took care of the sheep, that he probably beat the sheep harder and it happened to be the other person's sheep, or then the other person treated the other person's sheep more gently. We don't know all that. But those are trivial details that the Holy Spirit don't bother and basically, it's none of your business. And that's the same thing with our cases, too. Mm -hmm. See that? So these are cases where it's personal and details that, who knows, one party might have been more gentler, the other per person might have been more rough. But the point is, God don't care about that. So if he don't care about that, you shouldn't care about that either. Amen. All right? What he's looking at is, I just want you to stay unified. And then in, if it's inevitable that, look, there's not room for both of us. We're just too different. And the differences are causing the division and fight and losing our testimony. It's best that we separate from each other. It's needful. And guess what that means? That means you spread more Bible-believing truth. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Everyone trying to, these uh, churches always trying to chase them into their own church, you know, because we got a college over here. So come to our church and they want to keep them there so that their ministry can grow bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, I don't believe in that. I believe in spreading out. I believe in division. Why? Genesis 10, that's what God originally wanted. All right, is that division, that spreading out. And that's important for Bible believers. Yes, we're independent, we're local, and yeah, we could uh, work on our unity more, but actually it's the, best for uh, it's the best for us and it's the best throughout church history. The Lord never had one Catholic church that went from the beginning of the early 80s till now. He never did that. That's right. well, it always came out to splits, to new groups, and then when one group died out, the other group was able to carry it on. All right? You got the Dwas, you got Valdensians, and then the Anabaptists, 
Then uh, you got the Baptist, and then from the Baptist is split down where the Southern Baptist fell away with Albert Moeller and those guys. And then you got the Independent Baptist and the Independent Baptist have their problems with the Bible-believing Baptists. And then blah, 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 blah. Whoa, why can't we all get along? You're right, why can't we all get along? But it's inevitable, it's reality, and yes, it is needful. Because if I tied myself to the General Baptist movement today, Guess what? I'm no different from the Catholic Church. When you stay bound to a movement, what happens is it's inevitable. If you give it 1,000 years, does this one group never apostatize? It always, every human nature always apostatizes. That's why there has to be a split. That's good, All right, now look at Acts. This is a very important teaching. All right, look at Acts. You know what's sad? We call ourselves Bible believers. Why? To distinguish, mm -hmm. right, from all the other movements. But guess what? There's going to be splits and different movements of Bible believers or those who call themselves Bible believers, but they're not. By the way, there are apostate churches calling themselves Bible believers. Yeah. You know that? I type down, you know, you type down like San Jose Bible Baptist or something like that. Some different church pops out and they say we're Bible believing. I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have went to your church and not pastored this place. Otherwise, you guys wouldn't have came to that, my church. You would have went to their church. You know what? The, that's why we called ourselves real Bible believers. <laughs> that way we can really distinguish. No, we're the real Bible believers. Don't go with those apostates over there. So we had to do that. But guess what? There's going to be probably another false group. God forbid. I don't want to open Pandora's box. But there's going to be, yeah, there's going to be re, the, the re, <laughs> I was going to say the real Bible believers, but that's better. Real, real, real Bible believers. I'm telling you, man, it's why? Because that's history. It's called flesh, human nature. It's always going to happen. And if the Lord, uh, if the Lord uh, takes a while with the rapture, it's possible that if you give this church 200 years to carry on, apostasy will seep in somewhere. Why? It's called human nature. Human nature. So we have to understand these splits are very, very important. Why? Because it's spreading Bible-believing truth to different parts, and it's carrying on God's truth in a pure manner. Because truth in a pure manner is not found in a name or a label of a movement. All right, let's look at Acts chapter 15. The famous uh, church split passage that many people know. And verse 37, verse 37, Acts 15, verse 37. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul, but Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. Now notice there's a split here. But Paul does not consider Barnabas an enemy. He considers him a fellow Bible believer. He mentions his name later on. As a matter of fact, the topic of the church split is, should we have Robert Randall in our church? And then uh, Pastor, and Pastor Andrews says, uh, no, I don't want to keep him. And then I say, no, I don't want to keep them. And then there's, the contention is so sharp between us that there's a church split over some, uh, over some person who's a burden in our church named John Mark. All right. No, you take him. No, you take him. You take him. All right. So notice right here that Barnabas insists that, no, this guy would do some good, and then the other person says, no, he does, he's going to be a hindrance in the ministry. But Paul recognized the importance of John Mark right. later on. But we also have to understand that which, what is interesting is that a lot of the Bible-believing preachers see Paul as a good guy right here and not Barnabas. So isn't that interesting? So then it's like both, both parties have good points and bad points. That's the bottom line. But we see right here, both of them recognized each other's differences. And even though there was a split, they realized we're in the same ball team together. 
All right, and that's me too with other Bible believers is that uh, I'm in the same ball team as them, but I do know this, the way that they run their ministry and the way I do mine, it, we got to split. We got to split. And not only that, there's a personal difference and spiritual convictions. So it's so important to understand that from the eyes of the Holy Spirit, what he wants outsiders to know, what he wants outsiders to know is, look, this is just reality. People split. So it's nothing to dramatize over. All right? Just know it's, it's reality. The ideal thing is we all get along, but it's sad people split. And if people split, hey, I'm not going to point out who's right and who's wrong. All right? So just know the Lord uses both parties, and he did. He used Barnabas' ministry through John Mark. He became a great asset to Paul later. And he used Paul's ministry mightily where he was able to do something with, them, uh, Phil, uh, with the church at Philippi, the Philippians. So notice how God used both in spite of the split. So split, sometimes you have to understand, is needful. Why? To, here's, a, I, here's the irony. Separation is so needful to maintain unity. Yeah. Can I repeat that again? Yeah. Separation is so needful to maintain unity. Why? Because if I, if I never separate, if I stay with that party, then that unity of Bible believers is going to turn into an enemy with each other one day. So it's best that, hey, you know, instead of us turning enemies into each other and that the people don't get burdened by our Bible-believing churches and say, see that we're all, both parties are doing a great work for the Lord, let's just split, all right? Yeah. You do your thing, I do my thing. And yeah, I think I'm right with God and you're the one in the wrong, you know, and I know what I'm doing is right, so we'll see at the judgment seat of Christ. Yeah. <laughs> and then later on at the judgment seat of Christ, yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah, you're right, Lord. I, I could have done that better, yeah. yeah. That's what's going to happen, all right? Okay, go back to Genesis. I hope this lesson has been very eye-opening. That's the most important lesson I want you to learn. Because in my mind, I always was bothered by that. Why can't Bible believers just get along so we can spread Bible-believing truth together? But one thing I learned is that that never worked in church history. It's just reality, and God wants us to accept it. And if we accept that then we can start to have peace about it that the unity of Bible believers is still marching on. Yeah. All right? Amen. All right. Let's, and not only that, we, we spread out more. All right? If I stayed, let's say, I stayed at uh, San Pedro with Pastor Andrus, then Robert Randall will have no church to go to over here. You know, he would have shot himself. There's no pastor to bully or to tease, you know, <laughs> or to joke with. See? So... Me splitting, uh, well, I didn't split for him, but my point is me being in a separate territory and being over here, we spread more Bible-believing yes. truth. That's the point. Yeah. So this separation is needful to spread out. Why? It's inevitable in human history. It's called Genesis 10. God knows human nature. That's why he wanted that division, that spreading out. Why? Because it's part of inevitable human nature. We're so weak we're so fleshly, so yes, we need that separation once in a while. Amen. Don't tell me that, no, 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 we're, we're good, I'm very spiritual. No, you're not. You, you, uh, you get along with your woman or with your man. Don't tell me that, yeah, we can unite and keep conquering it together. No, you need that space moment. Don't tell me you don't do that, all right? You need your space moment. Don't tell me you never do that. You're telling me that you insist that, you know, we're going to lock up... We're going to lock up with each other in this same room. And yeah, you know, we're going to have a bad day, but we're going to... No, no, no. You, one person runs to the bedroom. The other person runs to the kitchen. Or one person goes out and does a long drive. Or one person says, I, I can't talk right now. I need to take time and pray to the Lord about this. Yes, it's, we're all weak. Yeah. No matter how spiritual you think you are. No, it's inevitable. It's reality. We need a split, okay? We need a moment, all right? Yes, I need a moment, all right? If you don't, I do, all right? I, I need a moment, all right? When I get in that moment and that fight, I, I need to go, I need to be, the tendency is to say something. So then I just go, <laughs> and then I take a deep breath. I need to separate myself from this world into my own little world with the Lord and go, okay, God, yeah. give me a, something to say. Or show me what to do, all right? We need that time, all right? 
Women need that time too, all right? Sometimes I, uh, I go, oh, okay, you know, and it's kind of hard for me, and I go, okay, and then hours later, we all right? Yeah. And I go, oh, not yet. So, <laughs> that happens, all right? So we need our separation. We need our separation. Why? It's needful. It's called human nature. We're all weak. Amen. Okay? Amen. All righty then. Uh, Genesis 13. I stress that enough. I got to get going on. But it's such an important lesson. I'm using, even though I'm using some humor and uh, some examples, I'm, I'm deliberately using these things to open your eyes more on how needful that distance, that separation is. All right? And just because you're separate, it doesn't mean that you're public enemy number one. Right. You notice that? But I'll tell you what, when people keep that, uh, keep that unity with that difference unresolved, no matter what, what happens? Then it turns into World War III, and you do become enemies. All right? That's why it's needful to have that separation. Why? Because the Lord can use you of your personal difference thing and the other person with his own personal difference thing and the Lord can use the differences for his glory. All right? Amen. Let's look at Genesis chapter 13 and then we'll look at verse 10. So Lot was given the option to uh, go to his separate territory and to pick whatever land he wants to in verse 9. That, that's really good, right? So it shows Abram's, Abram's kind-heartedness to think of others more than himself, whereas Lot is a greedy person and wants to take his territory. <coughs> so notice, in this needful separation, one party can still think uh, the betterment of the other party still. Does that make any sense? So then, like I told you, there might be some Bible-believing preachers and churches that I'm not close to, all right, that I kind of put the separation on, but I honestly, and I do want them to have that better land, that better territory. See, so such a thing is possible, and that is important is, no matter what, even when you do have the separation, like the Bible says, you have to esteem others better than yourself. You have to do that. You have to do that. You have to do that. Uh, if we keep reading onward. Verse 10, Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan that was well watered everywhere. So Lot, he started to take a look. When he started to take a look, he saw the plains of Jordan right here. So originally, remember they were in Bethel up here somewhere between Bethel and Ai. But uh, in Genesis, it called it uh, Hai, if I recall from memory. Later on, we see in Joshua, it's actually the city of Ai. But somewhere in between over there, Abraham Lot's up here. Lot was originally up here, then he saw all the plain of Jordan. Look at all that pretty stuff, guys. So here's the Dead Sea, you have to understand. Here's the Dead Sea. Over this side, northward, would be somewhere Bethel and Ai. And then if we go toward, notice east, when you look at east, that's where the beautiful uh, Sodom, Gomorrah, look at the beautiful Bay Area, Silicon Valley over there. Ain't that just so lovely over there? It's so beautiful. A lot of hiking spots, guys. Yeah. Still, in Google, it's the top 10 places in the world you want to travel. It still says that, all right? And they won't tell you how much you pay for rent, obviously. But Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan. So remember, the Jordan River, it's close, if not connected to the Dead Sea, for some of you who didn't realize that. So then he's seeing the plains right here. So Lot wants to move down here. So he starts to move down there. That it's well watered everywhere. So it's well watered in the plains of Jordan. Has enough water. Uh, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So before the Lord destroyed this area, it was still a very beautiful spot. But then the Lord, because he destroyed it, the beauty cannot be found anymore. 
All right, you might enjoy your beautiful place right now, but it won't last long when God's judgment comes. Won't it won't last, all right? So the lost world can enjoy what they have right now because you're, you're, borrow, you're borrowing uh, temporary time. All right, time's going to go real soon. Even as the garden of the Lord. See that? It's just as beautiful as the garden of Eden. That's how beautiful it looks. Like the land of Egypt. Ah, it's like Egypt. Remember, Lot came from Egypt. So then there's that worldliness in mind that, oh, I want to go back there to the world. Yeah. So then he sees that place and he wants to go over there. Even as like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. So when you go toward Zoar over there, Zoar is one of the five cities in, the, in this region in this Silicon Valley, San Francisco Bay Area. Zoar is called Little, okay? It's called Little. So you'll notice this nice little uh, city or town or village called Carmel right over there, all right? Small little place over there, all right? And then here's San Francisco over here, and then here's San Jose Gomorrah right over there. So in Sodom and Gomorrah, Zoar is part of these five terrains. There are five cities. Go to Genesis 14. Genesis 14. Genesis chapter 14. We'll read verse 2. That these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, right? But notice that these were in alliance with each other. They're all close with each other. King of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, so, and she, Meber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, which is what? Bela is also known as Zoar. So there's Adma and Zeboim. So we'll put this as Zeboim, and then the other one as Adma. There are five cities here. But look at uh, Deuteronomy 29. Look at Deuteronomy 29. God sent the destruction, and all four cities got wiped out, but except Zoar. Zoar was the one that survived. Now, some of you might wonder why. I think it's because it's a little city, so then there's uh, less sin, right? Usually when you go to a bigger city, there's more sin, correct? Yeah, we know that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's why there's high crime sometimes yeah. Yeah. when you go to like big city terrains. Right. So that's the reason why the Lord would have left it alone perhaps. So he left Zoar alone, but uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, too big, man. They got the Bay Bridge over there and then... They got those sodomite clubs over there, and they got just uh, too much stuff. They got the University of California at Berkeley over there, brainwashing people, you know. They got just uh, way too many restrictions, liberal mindedness, etc. So the Lord's like, I don't want to have anything to do with that. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 29. Look at verse 23. And that the whole land thereof is as the garden of the Lord, like the garden of Eden. No, is brimstone and salt and burning, that it is not sown, nor beareth, nor any grass groweth therein, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboam, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and in his wrath. That became nothing now. But notice it's the four cities, not Zoar. So one day it's going to happen. Now notice it said that grass is not growing, and it's like brimstone and salt. That's why some people suppose... If you, read Genesis, if you read Deuteronomy 29 and Genesis 13, it's obvious that Sodom, Gomorrah, and those cities would be near the Dead Sea then. Why? Because Lot saw the plains of Jordan, the Jordan River that was well watered. So we know the Jordan River is close, if not connected to the Dead Sea. Secondly, uh, you go to the Dead Sea terrain, it's infamous, uh, it's famous for its salt, and then the deadness, etc., so that's why it's most logical to put Sodom, Gomorrah, and those places at that terrain over there. But not only that, if we uh, go back to Genesis 13, Abram 
and Lot, they were originally right here. But the Bible says Abram went uh, southward, and then Lot, he went eastward. So if you go east of this side, it would make sense. Yeah, it would hit close. Uh, we know that Bethel is close to the Dead Sea terrain, and then if we go eastward, the Dead Sea is not far away. The Bible says Lot went east, and that would be found at, we'll read it a little bit later on, but verse 11. We'll see at verse 11. Actually, we'll read it right now. So in verse 11, then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. So Lot made his decision. I'm going to choose the plain of Jordan here. And Lot journeyed east. So that's proof right there. So Lot, he was going eastward here. So then, yes, it would make sense that Sodom, Gomorrah, the five cities would be close to this, to this Dead Sea terrain. If you look at a map, then it would match up very well. So notice he went the wrong direction, west to east. In the Bible, remember, that's always like a bad direction, right? Yeah. So Lot, he went west to east. Wrong direction, bud. Mm -hmm. He went to the wrong direction. West to east. And Lot journey east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. So now Lot and Abram separated from each other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan. So notice he's living in the land of Canaan here. And Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain. Now look at right here. He was dwelling the plain right here of these cities. Did you notice that? Look at the next step. And pitched his tent toward Sodom. He put his tent toward... Wow, that Bay Bridge is so beautiful. Let's go a little bit closer. Oh, I heard about, you know, the Sodomites over there and all kinds of uh, sinful stuff. But, you know, it's something that I can overlook. Plus, it's kind of pretty, those lights. Right. You know, let's go. Let's pitch toward over there. That way I can have a, a nice view, a nice outside view on, on these plains of looking at the beautiful city. Now, you notice the steps right here. You'll notice the steps right here, what Lot did. Verse 10, all right, you're going to hear this. This is a common sermon you're going to hear about Lot. The steps of Lot towards sin. First, okay, and you might want to write it down too for your own personal life if you want to. How does it go? It starts out with looking at verse 10. You look. All right, so Lot's sin is given in several steps. Sin always starts out in steps, folks. It's not like Lot became a sodomite. That's not what it said. All right? As a matter of fact, it points out Lot was a righteous soul, uh, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. But he became so messed up, he committed incest later on. <laughs> not, not much better than sodomites, I don't know, right? So you notice right here, then how did Lot end up that way? It goes with steps. You look. You know what you've been doing? You've been looking at the world too much. You've been traveling and going, wow, what a beautiful place. And then you became more open-minded, more tolerant of how different cultures do things. That's how it works. Uh-huh. Yeah. It goes that way. And then you're like, why, you know, my family or the Bible believers in back at that Bible-believing church over there, they're so narrow-minded. They don't have an open mind. They don't understand different cultures, how they think, Amen. how they do things. And yes, I know what I'm talking about. You have a kid, you go off to college in a different state. That's how they talk and act too. Yeah, back at my home, you know, narrow-minded, mom and dad didn't know what they're talking about in a Christian home, in that Bible-believing church. They weren't out in the city like me. And here I am in the city over here in San Francisco being seeing so many different diversities so you can understand and be more open-minded of many different religious perspectives. Yeah, that all goes that way. But you don't talk like that until you look at, look at it first. Yeah. I want to go to that university right there. and Be away from my family. And then, man, that's a beautiful university right there. What a life over there. And yeah, that's how it happens when you start out with the teenager and go into college years. You wonder why your kids become rebellious after that. Then uh, what happens? He looked. 
So it starts out with looking. You watch too much TV, you looked at too much of your worldly friends, you looked too much at the world, and so it drew your attention. You look. Then what happens next is verse 11. You make a choice. Hey, um, you know, I'm 18 now, and I'm a big boy. I'm a big girl now. I got to make my own decision. I'm going to go to such and such. I'm going to study in, in college over there. I'm going to go sign up for the military over there. I'm going to go to, and usually people, they, when they make these big decisions, they don't think about, what about my spiritual condition? Will it apostatize? That's good. No, they just think about, what a big opportunity. I got to take it. I'm going to miss out. That's your problem. That's why you joined Sodom's gate. Because you looked at it first. You wouldn't have made that decision if you didn't look first. But you looked first. Then you made a decision. Once you make a decision, then you look at verse 12. Dwelled in the uh, land of Canaan and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain. Look at that. He's living not in it, but just near it. Living close. Uh, you know, I'll still go to that. Uh, yeah, I, I remember that church you told me, Mom and Dad. I'll go there. I'll go there when I have time. Right. But I'm, uh, I'm just going through finals right now. It's just too busy. Yeah. I know what I'm talking about. Right, I went through secular university. Don't tell me that I don't know what I'm talking about. Right. That's why I made it a rule. Never skip church. And I meant that even if I was falling behind. Even if I was making bad grades, I was like, never skip church. I guarantee, I promise you this, if I did skip church, I would have fell, fallen away. Right. Yeah, me, who knows all the Bible and everything. Yes, 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 yes. Okay? So then it goes with living close, all right? I'm not moving inside the dorm, you know. I'm just close by it. Away from all that marijuana that, and the parties that are actually going on inside the dorms Preach. over there. Come on, All right, what happens then in four? Then four, you live close, you're not in it, but you're just living close to it because it's such a good job opportunity that you can't miss out on. And it's not like you're doing it, you're just nearby it. As long as you, you know, you got church nearby, so you'll be okay. Then verse 12 says, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. So notice that he's facing toward that direction. See, you're living close to it, and it's impossible. Let me say this. It's impossible when you live close to it, you will not face toward that direction. Yeah. You're going to face your attention. See, I say attention. Your attention will be directed to here. You know what? I, when I was uh, studying at Berkeley and then living close to it. My attention was in Berkeley, guys. So what did I have to do? I had to divert my attention. I had to divert it away and say, Sunday, don't forget, Sunday. Why? Because if my attention was always on Berkeley, guess what? The attention, the focus, the goal, the priority now is Berkeley, Berkeley, exam, I'm too busy, got a lot of work to do, got to follow up with my professor rather than the pastor, rather than the church member. That's what happens. Yes, I know what I'm talking about. Amen. That's right. So that's the fourth step. The fifth step, look at Genesis 19. All right. Do you think Lot was a good boy and just stayed there? Lot was a good boy and just stayed there. He never moved inside San Francisco, right? Look at Genesis chapter 19 and verse 1. So he was sitting in the pla plains of that city, Sodom, all right? Genesis 19, verse 1, And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat at Fisherman's Wharf of San Francisco. All right, see? He was right there. 
Why? Because the trolley looks nice. I want to take it a little once in a while. Yeah, the bay is so nice. Look at that. Isn't that Dead Sea beautiful? It wasn't Dead Sea back then, you know. It was given probably Sea of Sodom or the Sodomite Sea or something like that, you know. Look at that Sodomite Sea and now it's become the Dead Sea. All right, let's go back. Uh, Psalms 1, Psalm 1, Psalm 1, and time's up. Okay. Ah, I didn't come to the interesting one. All right, but let's go to Psalm 1. Psalm 1. All right, let's close it off here. An important verse that should be memorized, and there are uh, little children who actually quote this verse, but it should be memorized. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, all right, nor what? Standeth. Standeth. Okay, it didn't say living in, moving in, or just smoking marijuana right now. It didn't say that. Standeth. The way of sinners, nor what? Sit it in the seat of the scornful. So notice right here that the steps, seat, backwards stand, but then what? Walk. That's the steps that match up with Lot's sin. What matched up with Lot's sin over here is these steps. One, don't walk close. Don't walk towards it. Don't walk where the ungodly, the bad environment is at. You don't get there until you walk toward there, right. until you go toward there. Secondly, when you, once you walk near it, guess what? You will not immerse yourself in it. You will not do it, but you're just going to stand, stand by it. Yeah. You're going to stand next to it. Look, when you're standing in front of that liquor in front of you, don't tell me you're not going to do something after that. Three, then you sit. And you sit down with sin. And guess what? Let sin play its game with you. That's what happens. So don't follow this pattern and this path, what Lot did. All right. Verse 13 was the most interesting one. I'll do that next Genesis study. If you look at verse 13 of Genesis 13, 13, that's a great number, right? 13, 13. Notice right here that the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. In our next Genesis study will be intensely interesting. What was going on in Sodom? They weren't called Nephilim. They were called Rephaim. And they were doing something there. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that uh, today's teachings have been a blessing to the hearers, have been very thought-provoking and helpful with our daily walk in life, with how we communicate with others, how we're a testimony, and how we can live our everyday lives to please you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.